So this week we're doing traditional axe construction with a folded forge welded hatchet. We're starting with 25 by 10, 8 and 3 quarter inches of. The pole is marked at 4 inches and it is 3 quarters of an inch across. On the underside, the outside of the cheeks of the axe are marked at 2 and a half inches from the edge. So we'll start by liberating the pole of the axe from the steel. So placing the outside of the mark, placing the outside of the centre dot over the edge of the anvil and do a set down. I, you can do it to half the thickness. I tend to do it a little bit thinner than that. And keep checking both sides of the material to make sure that you are forging both sides to an even thickness. And give it a straighten. Once you've done one end, find the outside of the mark from the other side of the pole and do the same thing. You want to use nice heavy even hammer blows to make sure that the start of the cheeks are the same width. Now you notice that when I'm straightening I'm not hitting any material which is in contact with the anvil. I don't want to forge it, I just want to straighten it. Once you've liberated the pole you want to define the end of the cheek. So find the mark, and this is on the other side of the steel. The mark's at two and a half inches from the edge. And do another set down. Now this is filmed making two axe heads. I think I went a little thin on this one. with the hammer half on, half off the anvil. So once you've defined the cheeks, you want to spread them out a bit. And I'm using the cross pin for that, which will spread the material sideways rather than drawing out the length of the cheeks. You'll notice I've got the set down overhanging the edge of the anvil. That saves distorting it or damaging it. So this bit is where you really find out where your hammer skills are at, uh, because you will forge out the crossbeam marks with the flat of your hammer. I'm using a big hammer for this, mainly because it's got quite a nice wide face. Uh, chasing out those cross pin marks. There we go, nice wide cheek. So that if you didn't get too close to the pole of the axe, uh, you can go in with a set hammer. Equally you could do this using the set down and just clean it up by putting the edge of the pole over the anvil like when you first created it. Just clean up those hammer marks. Some people quite like hammer marks on their work. I'm not, not a massive fan myself. So I want to create diamond shaped cheeks. Uh, so that is basically the same as forging a square to a circle. Um, you can just put it at 45 degrees over the edge of the anvil. And uh, I'm right like that. 
it will distort because the material's a little bit on the thin side. Um, but it's just a case of flattening it out every now and then. If you keep on top of it, you won't, you won't have any problems. Obviously, if you don't keep on top of that, you'll end up with something like a bowl of spaghetti, but it's your own fault. As you'll notice, I've got a new camera at the moment. Much better video quality than the previous one. So that is the eye and the pole shaped. So you might be able to see see where we're going with this now. So I will heat up the central part and uh, bend it to shape. Literally just over the edge of the anvil, you don't need to use the beak or anything, anything fancy. Bend it, mostly centrally. Keep checking that you're bending it evenly. If one end's bending more than the other, turn it over. Make sure, make sure everything's even and square. Close that up and um, square off the pole. You can leave it rounded if you want. Um, it's up to you rather than me, but I quite like it being nice and square. I try and do it as crisp as possible, though it's not massively important because um, I'm going to grind that part anyway later. So once you've closed it up, uh, open it up again. And that will allow you to insert a piece of carbon steel. I'm just using tongs, spreading it out a bit. So mark off the carbon steel. This is EN42 high carbon spring steel, which produces a better edge than EN45 because uh, it's got a higher carbon content, but it's not as tough. So I will then flux looks um, both parts quite heavily. Uh, it's probably the only time you'll see me using flux when I'm welding carbon steel. Because the welding point of the mild steel is above the burning point of the high carbon steel, so I tend to flux these. We've got them assembled. You can see there's a gap, we'll get to that in a minute. And I will just tack weld, tack weld it into place and that will save it flying out. I mean you don't have to tack weld it but it's a bit more annoying than getting up to welding heat finally and um, it flying out before you can weld. So a couple of tacks both sides. It won't really show up in the finished piece anyway. And uh, Last what I do is to weld a bar to the end of the pole. And um, that makes it a lot easier to handle rather than messing around with tongs. Okay, we're ready for welding. So I will now very slowly heat it up to welding point. You do want to heat it up slowly because uh, if you heat it up too quick the outside of the piece will reach welding point before the inside and just won't weld it. So flux quite heavily again. Make sure I'll make sure I have a good coating of flux for carbon steel. It does help prevent oxygen getting to the bit. So then I will do my welding under the power hammer. And just like that, that's welded. Turn over, weld, make sure you blend in the weld on the um, 
front side. You'll notice that I'm flipping it to about 45 degrees every now and then and that's because it's not forging square. So I need it to be square otherwise it'll affect the welding and the shaping and everything so I just kind of chase the squareness back in by tilting it at an angle. So I generally take two welding heats. First one welds in the carbon steel bit, the second one will close the gap uh, above the carbon steel bit. Third welding heat, just blend in. And quite gently on this one just to reduce any risk of carp's mouth or anything. So once it's welded, head over to, I mean you could do this under the power hammer, but I like to do it by hand. Well, sometimes I'll do it under the power hammer, depends how lazy I'm feeling. And uh, just knock off those corners and round it up. And the purpose of that is when you start spreading spreading it with to an axe shape with the cross beam, uh, the mild steel will move faster than the carbon steel and start forming a carp's mouth along the outer edges. So to take that out of the equation, I will just round off the corners of the mild steel and um, it will still try and form a carp's mouth, but what that will do is it will just chase it to square. There we go, in with the cross beam. I do occasionally do this with a power hammer, or well, I usually do it with a power hammer because it's a lot quicker, but um, my fullering tool is out of action at the moment and I haven't got around to making a new one, or an improved one. Uh, I'll make a good video, maybe that can be bothered or not. Uh, so cross bean it and you'll notice that I'm flipping it over every now and then and that is just to spread it evenly uh, otherwise you'll end up with one side of mild steel very thin and one side quite thick. Every now and then I just dress it for carp's mouth. Uh, for carrying on. And basically just keep going until it's the shape that you want, the shape that you like or you haven't got any more material to spread. If I wanted to make a normal axe rather than a hatchet, uh, I would use slightly bigger, slightly thicker material. Just dress it for squareness every now and then, make sure it's straight. Uh, you're basically roughing it out on the anvil, and then what I tend to do is just head over to the power hammer and use a round back flatter. I could use a regular flatter, uh, whether you've got a striker or whether you're on your own. Or you could just use a wise faced hammer to take out all the cross pin marks. Uh, I've got a power hammer. I will do it under the power hammer. It's a lot quicker, a lot easier. Saves time, times money. I, mean, I could sell all these for cheaper. And all that. Basic economics. You tend to get a more regular finish under the power hammer as well. So I pop over to the vise. Uh, from forging it you do get some distortion in the eye so I'll just twist that back to where it wants to be. Uh, and we are now ready to drift it. Well, in a minute. I'll straighten out a bit. And so I'm providing support with the tongs to take the bend out of the central part. So back to the vise and dropping the drift in. So I'm using the vise kind of as a um, well as a support basically to save the um, cheeks distorting. Um, and I've got the vise open just enough that the cheeks can't pass through it, but the bandrel can. Um, I'll just open up the vise every now and then when the drift starts binding. Uh, just to let it through a bit more. 
As simple as that. I don't really do any forging on the mandrel to shape the cheeks or anything. Uh, just because it's just a mild steel mandrel and I don't want to distort it. I've done it pro If I made the iron properly in the first place, I won't really need to do that much dressing afterwards. Just a few taps, just to close it up or shape it. But I really don't want to cause a dip in the mandrel. Because well, then I'll have to make a new mandrel and I haven't got time. Ideally I'd make a new mandrel out of forklift tine or something reasonably tough, maybe air hardening steel. Uh, the mild steel one works fine at the moment. Uh, it's something that beginners can do quite easily. So I cut the axe head off the uh, bar and uh, shape the edge. Now this will have a carp's mouth which will be quite tight, but I'll just keep grinding until I get to clean steel. Dress the outer edges a bit. If you forge this quite cleanly, you will only literally need to clean this up rather than grinding it to shape. Quite nice cinematography this, isn't it? So, roughed out. And I will clean out the grinder marks on my nice new Clark finisher. Just wanted to test what uh, using a vertical platen was like. Very good, I've used it quite a lot since I got it. I will probably either make or buy a bigger one at some point. And just clean up the uh, cheeks. Uh, not covering too much of the grinding because, um, well, anybody can grind something to shape. More the forging I wanted to show. And uh, there we go. Hatchet ready for heat treat. Now, I didn't have time to heat treat it, but I might make a second video showing how to heat treat these at some point. Uh, there we go. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. All that. Those of you who stayed to the end. And I'll uh, see you on the next one. Bye.